Welcome to Verify This, a podcast brought to you by Kindatis. We deliver bespoke identity and access management solutions leveraging the Microsoft Entra product family. Our solutions are designed to simplify onboarding, enhance security, and boost business efficiency for clients globally. Throughout the series, we'll connect with leading experts across the industry to bring you insight on all things digital identity. Hear about trending issues, lessons learned, and priorities for the future with an identity verification and authentication. The real value of, uh, of learning is about the ability to process information rather than to simply retain it. The learner owns their data. The learner operates their data for forever. Welcome to our latest episode of Verify This. Once again, I'm your host, Lucy McNeil, Product Marketing Lead at Candatis. And today we have another very exciting guest joining us for discussion, Dr. Keith Lick, Vice President of Education Solutions at Territorium. Territorium is a global education technology company with 12 million users worldwide on a mission to unlock the power of education and experience by focusing on the results of learning, utilizing new technologies such as AI, digital credentials, and decentralized solutions. Dr. Luke is a former teacher, principal and superintendent and within Territorium is supporting the design of solutions for learners and their institutions to capture and apply competencies acquired, opportunities for growth and connections to employment more robustly and more accurately. Welcome, Keith. Well, hey, good to see you. Can you? <laughs> uh, yes, good. <laughs> tick, tick. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about a variety of topics within the education sector, specifically looking at the transformation of the industry, the learner experience, interoperability and user ecosystems from education, skill assessment to employment. Um, first, I just want to call out why we're really excited to have you on the episode um, today. Um, I mentioned before in other episodes that Candatus works across a variety uh, of industries and the purpose of this podcast is to really speak to different experts and individuals across the the ones that we work in and even beyond um, and I think what's super exciting about Territorium is it might not seem like an obvious you know uh, candidate to, to be a topic of discussion when we're thinking about identity and access management but the purpose of Verify This is how do we leverage digital identity or forms of someone's identity for a greater good and how we leverage different technologies to achieve that and certainly you know with your experience that we'll get into uh, but Candatis's goals as well is creating a seamless experience uh, for a student or an employer or an institution or faculty so I think that's where there'll be some really nice nuances. But fundamentally, there are some um, foundations that that we'll see that kind of carry across the work that you do and your motivations uh, and, and kind of general digital identity um, as well. It's not access management for maybe a solution or a, a login, but it's rather right. access, you know, digital identity for access to one's future. So um, I think it's going to be be a great one. So I guess to begin with, for, for folks listening in, it would be really awesome to hear a bit about you. I mentioned before, you, you know, you've got very relevant experience to be in your current role, teacher, principal, superintendent, and now we're in the world of ed tech, I think we're calling it. So kind of what have been your inspirations and motivations for getting you to, to your current stage and your current point? So in most of the environments in which I have worked educationally, my learners often struggled to be able to present their full cohort of skills and abilities through the traditional means that we have in education. Report cards, transcripts, those sorts of things, uh, standardized test scores was missing so many of my learners' capabilities. Um, as examples, I have been in some struggling environments whereby my students actually earned their pilot's licenses before they earned their driver's licenses, things that wouldn't show up on a transcript. I had students in a particularly struggling environment whereby our automotive academy would defeat MIT every year in the hybrid car competition. Again, things that were not going to appear in a traditional way. And oftentimes in schools, like we forgot to tell students that, hey, by the way, this is a big deal. And here's how you present this information moving forward. So I've been on a quest, if you will, to try and find a better vehicle for learners to do that. I've been very lucky to be surrounded by very committed faculty. And we would carry kids one by one to an employer, or to a position of higher education and so forth and say, don't worry about X, Y, or Z. Let me tell you what the student is able to do. 
but can't take that to scale. And I knew there had to be a technological solution to at least make that more accessible, both for institutions to present the capabilities of their learners, as well as for learners to be able to do that themselves. And that's what's really gotten me into this work to try and, uh, I like to complain, but I recognize that I'm only allowed to complain if I'm also working on the solution. So this is my way of justifying my complaint. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think that's it. Exactly. It's it's being problem based, you know, focused is is identifying where are the issues and what can we do to alleviate that. And so how did you transition into an environment where there's technology being leveraged for these? And and how how influential have you been in, in the decisions as to where, you know, the work territorium is doing right, right now? So I've always fancied myself to be a bit of a techie. So I think that's also what made it easier for me to try and get into this side of the world. Uh, I remember working with some of my faculty on this particular issue ahead of us, honestly, when the technology existed. And we were contacting companies and said, we need a system that can do this and that and the presentation of student skills and abilities. And it simply didn't exist. So it was by chance, quite honestly, that through a colleague, I was introduced to Territorium knowing that they were at the time coming into the United States around technological functioning of skills and abilities. And that's what in fact got me to the organization. Now the organization at the time had been around for a decade. It had already amassed you know, 10 million users in 15 countries, but most of that was based upon their development of a learning management system and a strong online remote proctoring assessment system. But the learner's stories as to how the company got created actually comes from the skills and abilities world that drove the learning management system and the assessment system. And the story goes that they enter college, uh, decided that at the time they didn't like the LMS, built a competing one because they were those kind of cool, again, the tech whiz kids at the time. Business blows up by their senior year. They're not going to class. They're just going and, and working the business you know, globally. They go to the college president who was a client at the time and said, hey, we got to drop out because you're a client and business is blowing up. And the president was smart enough to say, pump your brakes, let's use your work experience towards your credits, let's use your faculty as your business advisors. All I need to see is evidence of your achievements as they align to the learning outcomes of the courses you would traditionally be enrolled in. And that quickly evolved their thinking and development into what was first the skills and abilities guide into a more competency-based side of the learning management system and then the assessment system that was more about identifying skills and abilities in multiple ways and then coming into the U.S. around what is now the comprehensive learner record for learning and employment record movement, which we see globally as a way of interpreting and digesting and moving verifiable credentials. Yeah, it's some story. And I think, <laughs> I mean, talk about using your time wisely and it was great that that the, the, the person in charge was able to recognize that That's um right. so I, I think it's really interesting and it ties in nicely you know it comes back when we when we first met I had found a, an article that you'd written um and it was all around uh, it was a couple of years ago um in the journal and it was all about how important it was to be able to provide proof of skill and how essential that was for a student's future success. And, and I think I said to you, I was like, I read the first line and I was like, I already know I'm going to love this. It's like, you know, when I, I cringe when we ask high school, you know, students oh. in their final years or penultimate years to, to write a resume or a CV. And I was saying to you, I felt seen, right? <laughs> I think many people, you know, my peers, you know, uh, our sort of generation, are going, everyone to be quite honest is going, this is so true. I mean, what are we putting on this realistically? You know, right. you might have done some extracurricular activities, but I mean, but fundamentally, you probably don't appreciate the skills that have been acquired even in those extracurricular activities. All you're saying is, I might have played this sport. You know, you're not necessarily being like, I'm really good at communication. I'm a team player. I'm a collaborator. Um, and I just thought that was so relatable. And it got me thinking back to, you know, when I was you know, leaving school, thinking about the same things. And I think now recognizing the position that we're in with, you know, the, the, the steps that have been made with technology, we're looking at, OK, how does artificial intelligence play into the problems that that existed and still do exist today? So I'm curious to hear based on the variety of of you know, spaces you've worked in within education, 
you know, the evolution of it, you know, and this new idea of, of learner sovereignty, um, this new priority and, and um, you know, attention to skills. How has that evolved? So there has been always a quiet movement around competencies. And that has never, for many years, we've had curriculum and the retention of information as the driving measure of educational achievement versus what can you do with that information? And that is, I think, even though that transition really started, you go back to the at least mid to late eighties, the previous century, which is not often you get to say that. Um, <laughs> the educational arena is a slow moving ship as far as it's to be able to adjust. And I think we are now coming to terms with the fact that uh, the real value of, uh, of learning is about the ability to process information rather than to simply retain it. Um, I often make the joke that I, I am sure that Australopithecus is upset that we don't today know how to rub two sticks together to make fire. Um, and I think eventually we will, you know, we have that same criticism, like how do you not know you know, the phylus, you know, phylum genus and species and memorize those things and everyone just pulls out their phone and says, well, I can, you know, look it up on the internet. And I think that's the the aura that we're getting into. And in doing that, it unlocks the ability to see that the acquisition of skill happens throughout the journey. It is not solely an end destination. Um, and there are skills and micro skills, if you want to call it that way, or stackable skills. We use the word badges and credentials pretty loosely to cover all of those things. And as that environment changes, it becomes both a bottom up and top down evolution. Bottom up being us doing a better job of telling learners, hey, it's not just about the B in the world geography course that matters. It's the fact you learn to build a pivot table in that course, comparing agrarian resources and economic trends. And that's a skill of data analytics. And then to be able to say from the top down side, employers are looking for someone not with a B in geography, they're looking for someone with a skill of data analytics. So it's about being able to create that translation. And then as translated, giving the learner the ability to prove it and the employer or the higher ed, whoever is receiving that information to trust it. And that's, I think, what we're, we're watching and participating in the occurrence. Yeah, I think I think your nod to it sounds an obvious one, but but I think frankly is the internet. I mean, I think I might have been one of the last generation that was in that tipping point where we kind of got it, we kind of didn't quite have it. It was so you know it was going through your internet, you were hearing the fact sounds and all of that good stuff, but certainly you know in in my sort of education that's changed everything i started to going to ict lessons and you know learning all these skills to make powerpoints as, as well as your traditional okay learn how headlands are made in geography right so i think and it is it's really quite it seems an obvious one but it but it's really changed the game and um you mentioned competencies as well. I mean, more and more, even the way in which people are interviewed, you have your culture interview and then you have your competency questions, your competency interviews. Um, and that's all about, OK, tell me about a scenario where um, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be in a work environment. As you say, it's, that's it's right. the, I, I did this project and I worked on this and this is me proving my skill set. So it's, it really has changed. And And, you know, when I chat to my parents about job interviews or my experience that university for example it, it, they're like this is night and day like we didn't have that we didn't do that it was all more um you know traditional so it's come a long well, way so and I think yeah I think the investment from university in, which has often been omitted is so much of our skill demonstration skill acquisition and who we really present ourselves beyond university is often in those experiences that happen beyond the classroom whether they were internship, apprenticeship, student governments, uh, residence life, community engagement, that really helped us as learners synthesize what we were doing in the classroom. But when we sit in on an interview, we're often describing those experiences yeah. more than the paper you wrote your second year, you know, and being now to be able to capture that information from a skill standpoint and giving learners the ability to be proud of that and to realize like that's really important information to demonstrate. Um, is a much more lively and I think accurate way to reflect what we're doing. 
100%. And and that leads nicely to what I'd love to kind of cover um, next is a little bit more about some of the products on offer at Territorium, because it kind of gives a bit more context to why what we've chatted about is of interest. So there's there's a few key ones. You, you We've mentioned comprehensive learner records. You mentioned credentials. There's a, a credential wallet um, and, a, and a newer product, I believe, called the Life Journey Toolkit. So kind of briefly walk us walk us through those and, and kind of the, the the goal of those products. Well, the entire goal of the life journey, we'll think of it as one single solution, one umbrella term, is about right. moving learners to employment based on verified skills. In order to do that, there are three components which either can work, in most cases work in tandem. You don't have to have all three. You can modularize. That's a whole other part of the story. But the first piece of it is providing the learner a digital space to store their credentials. So a digital wallet, uh, you'll hear credential wallet. You'll hear ePortfolio a little bit. It's not exactly, and we can get into the semantic part of it. But the first is like, let's get you a wallet. Into the wallet, you can receive earned, achieved, verifiable skills and credentials. So the system has a badging platform as well through interoperable standards. We can talk about that word in a minute too, to make sure that essentially the learner gets their data, the learner owns their data, the learner operates their data for forever. So inside of this wallet, it's gonna have a unique set of skills specific to me. Your wallet's gonna have your skills based on your achievements. And then from that information, we are able to analyze the skills represented and show you your alignment to the field or fields that you're pursuing. You are 65% of the way towards becoming an accountant. You are 35% towards becoming a marketing manager. And in doing those percentages, we are essentially showing you the skills that you have and the ones that are remaining. Now, knowing the ones that are remaining, that puts the learner in a much greater position of efficacy to advocate for themselves around these are the experiences I need, these are the courses I need, these are the additional opportunities I need to round out what is the dominant part of that qualification. In certain regions of the world, we're taking that a step further and showing you exactly how you line up to real-time positions in the job market and to which you can actually apply to those roles. All of that information, though, for the learner is first based upon the CLR, the instrument or engine, the admin console of an institution whereby they can build their badges, build their stackable credentials, even tie those to learning experiences and learning outcomes within and beyond the classroom. So an institution is able to determine these are the opportunities where learners can demonstrate competencies and we will stand behind the issuing of these competencies through badges and credentials to those learners and into their wallet. Cool thing is, is that the greater level of detail that an institution puts into it, the greater level of detail they get out of it from a reporting mechanism. The analytics now are much more reflective as to the incremental achievement of learners rather than just overall attrition and retention rate sort of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the last piece of this is the online assessment engine, which allows you to either A, deliver pre-approved assessments that are credible for measuring particular skills and abilities or for institutions to create their own and giving learners another opportunity to demonstrate what they know, how they know it, and what they're able to do, even up to and including like the submission of evidence. Um, if I want to prove, if I came to you with prior learning, because on my job, I've learned Python programming, I can send you code, your computer science department can evaluate whether or not I actually learned some Python code. And that then keeps me on a more individualized pathway because you're awarding me credit for the work that I have done. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. And I, I think I mentioned this to you, you know, my experience of of sort of being connected or inspired to a potential role was a tick box exercise of things I right. might, you know, and it was all like personality trait based. <laughs> and, you know, it was like, do you like working with people? Yeah, I like people. Yeah. OK, do you like working in, with computers? OK, yeah. All right. That's narrowed it down a little bit. But this is actually much more. OK, what skills have you gained that you're obviously very good at, that you're naturally good at? Let's look That's at right. that and then let's give you options and you can see based on this, what what are, what motivates you and then what more do you have to do? So it's a lot more personalized, I think, which is really nice. And I think more than ever, that's going to be really relevant because with our, I think with the current culture, definitely more and more people are prioritizing well-being over having a job to have a job, you know, and it's more about being rewarded and so I think people are wanting to be a lot more intentional with that so I think it's very um very interesting um you mentioned 
quite a few stakeholders there. So, um, and and I think the word even came up in what you're talking about interoperability. So, this is 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 something that's come up. This is a nuance, right? This is a perfect example of where you know we digital identity is not necessarily like for like in what what I do and what you do, but but fundamentally, you're in a scenario where you have a solution. You have multiple stakeholders, multiple different standards, especially for thinking about institutions. And then especially with Territorium as an example, where you're crossing sort of borders uh, right. across the world. How how is this considered in development and, and how how does one tackle that in the education industry specifically? I mean, I don't expect you to have all the answers, but because <laughs> it's a biggie, but but your perspective would be would be fascinating. So I think the ease of which the information and how you design systems to go across borders hinges upon first establishing the priority that a learner should be able to own and operate their data as an individual responsible entity. And if you start from that as the premise, then the technological design becomes much easier in conceptualizing and advancing. So, because now we're not trying to think that we'll do the the reverse example, like the best way to discipline kids is you find out what they love and you take it away from them. So if the data is we know that you value this the most and we proprietarily control that, now we have an influence over you, but you're not really owning your data. So Territorium has said from the onset, data is that of the learners, let them be in full control of it. And in order to empower learners, now we've got to make sure that the systems we build and the way in which we communicate that information has to be readable, exchangeable through what we abide by our open standards. So think of it as the CSV file of learner data, right? Someone sends you a table with a bunch of numbers. As long as it's in the CSV file, pick your favorite spreadsheet program. It's going to open it up. Um, there are lots of other kind of interoperable examples, right? We all have you know, transportation roads throughout all of our lands, and we don't care if it's a Ford or a Chevy or a Peugeot or whatever else that's riding on. It's all built for vehicles to these standards. We are committed to being able to do that for our learners to make sure that, again, they can truly fully own and operate their data. Now, interoperability takes two, right? I can present this information for the learner in ways that are, in fact, open to the common languages that exist, but the recipient also has to be able to play by those same rules to take that information in. And in most cases, these negotiations, technologically speaking, go pretty well. Um, there's some debates on this, but usually there's some workarounds like, you know, okay, maybe to stick with the road example, maybe you have to take a side street as opposed to the highway to get to where you're going. And that's where like LTIs and APIs and all this other technological language comes in to make sure that it fits. But it's about making sure that, look, you know, this whole side of the skills transition is still relatively new. And we can't say exactly what it's going to look like in 50 years. So let's make sure that as the for-profit technological, you know, university, nonprofit, all that world tries to figure it out. Let's make sure we protect the learner first by making sure that the data we create for them to operate and own is always in a, a very secure and safe setting, but also then done in a way that allows them to plug into many different of the configurable outlets we find when we try and take our hairdryer with us when we travel. Yeah, it's a great analogy. I mean, the road one as well. I mean, it's, it's a great example where you have the road's fundamentally the same, the car's fundamentally the same, but your standard might vary because it's the wrong side of the road. <laughs> but but right. but and it then it works. forces us as vendors to, to to differentiate ourselves on the level of service we're providing to them. And that's a, a much healthier um, uh, effort. Yeah, I think it's it's a word that's said a lot that sometimes make people in identity go, oh, you know, bespoke. It's like we hear it all the time, bespoke, bespoke. But it's true. Um, and, and um, you know, you just it's lucky if you're surrounded by very smart people that, that can say, actually, yeah, we can. We can make it pretty bespoke for you. I didn't know that word till two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say today, I thought, did I teach Dr. Keith Luke something? <laughs> you did. I'll That's teach you some Scottish words, word. maybe. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um, but but yeah, I mean, inter people think of interoperability and they go, oh my God, 
I just can't even think about where to begin. But actually what we're seeing is possible. You've just got to look at it from the right angle. And and then obviously ecosystems come into it. So in, in Candatus, there's we've worked with with different clients where there's been like huge ecosystems. I mean, we collaborated um, on um, pieces where uh, it was a, a utilities company and they had multiple different trusts within one overarching organization that all had different technology, but they all had to um, verify access for different areas of their organization. And the, the kind of what ultimately came down to was we need to build a trust framework we need to it's all fine and well we're going to make these verifiable credentials that that the person is going to own it's going to belong to them we've aligned standards we are adhering to standards but how do we get to a point especially when you're going across geographical boundaries how do we get to a point where uh, a, a verifier can trust the issuer and so there's a great deal of buy-in i suppose that has to happen as well when you're looking at higher education to institution institution to potential employer yes and really there's a couple pieces to that sure we can trust really means two different things first it's a technological handshake that's the easy part but the relational part of it's you know, different um and it really i don't have a great answer to that in the moment uh we think about it from university standpoint, like we deal with this to some extent, because if you have a degree from university, it's the same concept. Like we trust if you have a degree in biology and whether it's from, you know, Wales or University of California in Los Angeles or, you know, University of Johannesburg, we just assume that that degree in biology kind of means the same thing. And we then kind of think about it contextually. And that is just as valid or just as not valid as my ability to display. I have this skill or credential from this particular provider. Now, what is happening in where these two areas blend is that in the technological standards, we are now able to attach the actual evidence that a learner submits improving their competency, which I think is it's appropriate to say it's game changing, maybe is, is an overstatement, but certainly significantly evolutionary. So if I'm able to demonstrate leadership or collaboration or things without a universal definition, but I can show you the video, the PowerPoint, the project, the PDF, the assessment as to what that meant when I earned it as verified by my institution, the recipient's going to have a much higher degree of authenticity in determining the extent to which it is demonstrating the skill in the way in which that institution is looking to uh, acknowledge, reward, and advance it. And it's going to be evidence uh, that I think for a while will be a very critical factor in this equation. Yeah, I think it's, well, and and as you say, we've been, we've come this far of being like, right. yeah, okay, you said you went to University of Strathclyde? Sure. I don't think I've ever been asked to, to actually, I don't even know where my degree is quite candidly. <laughs> I should probably find that. Um, but, and that leads nicely to, to something I'd love to kind of get your perspective on in terms of this notion of if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Something I've seen uh, when it comes to maybe more revolutionary technology or an evolution of existing technology is is a degree of reluctance to want to to take a shift is that something you've seen within the education sector specifically or even employer sector is or or are people like yeah let's go for it this is a no brainer i think that the no brainer is the immediate reaction and then you ask the second question around okay let's do it and then it's like everyone starts staring at their shoes you know, yeah. like, please don't call on me to figure this out. Please don't call on me to figure this out. Yeah. Um, I think that comes from the fact that most of the individuals that are in the decision-making roles for this kind of evolution didn't come through this pathway. So it's a much harder thing to get your head around when you're essentially trying to do for people and with people things that you yourself haven't directly experienced and are still likely guiding, you know, guiding people accordingly. You know, it's, you know, there's lots of conversation, at least in the U.S., around the extent to which 
you know, you need a college degree because, you know, we need plumbers and we need electricians and, and all that's absolutely true. And the individuals that are the most educated in the country, and you ask them, well, what are you doing for your kids? And it's like, well, I still think university is important. So it's that trying to understand how this moves. So what I think unlocks it ultimately is, is how the power structure, structure trickles. It's going to be, again, top down, bottom up. Bottom up, we've talked about the identification of skills really helps better identify and celebrate what educational institutions are doing for them. Awesome. When an employer finally says, okay, in order to acquire this job, I need my HR, my human resources department, or our talent acquisition system to cull all the applicants based upon these specific skills, that at that moment, the game changes. Because now, education environments are obligated to help their learners find those opportunities and make sure those skills are identified to be able to link as opposed to just simply showing them as having completed something. Um, and that's part of the problem is that, you know, there are lots of learners today that don't start on day one and finish their academic diploma or credential or, or, or degree in the number of years required. They are often accessing education and the time, resources, and availability they have. But along the way, no matter how long it takes them, they're acquiring these concrete, immutable, valuable, marketable skills that they can use to advance their careers. And when we haven't acknowledged that before, we've left a lot of people stuck. And I think that's where we've had labor shortages and that sort of thing, because we've essentially just referred to you as a non-completer or a dropout. When in fact, you just haven't finished everything, but the stuff that you do have is really important. And valuable. So when we start framing the conversations in these ways, we see places open up and realize that you don't have to stare at your shoes. You can look me in the eyes and we can have this conversation on how we actually take advantage of it. We're not necessarily changing the curriculum, not changing the way we do instruction. We just want to help acknowledge the, the great things you're doing for learners, all of the things, and making sure that you understand that the greatest value of your institution, that brings value is probably the wrong way of saying it, a significant value of your institution is being able to truly prepare that learner for life after, during and after time in your institution. And this is what helped unlock that along the way. And then I think people kind of take a sigh of relief and realize like, oh, cool, you're actually trying to help celebrate the work that we do as opposed to critique or change or you know, somehow degrade. And it's exactly the opposite. Yeah, that's such a good point. It's It's not that it's been wrong. It's how can we take it to the next level? What I think is nice is it creates a bit of a flywheel because... Right. I would assume that the learners are somewhat maybe easier to sell the value to. You think, great, I actually have a way to show off everything I've achieved. But as you say, it's just almost expressing to the learners and then ultimately employers, all it's going to do is, first of all, make you as an institution stand out because the learners are going to love that you're facilitating this. Second of all, you know, you're supporting your perspective on how well you're kind of giving these learners kind of a, a jump in to uh, future, be that employment or, you know, a master's or what have you or a trade. Um, but I think as well is it will be really interesting for employers to be able to to see and actually get the right people because I think probably more often than not well scenarios everyone's probably been in somebody's been hired and they've been really good at saying they're the right person for the job and then when push comes to shove actually it's not the case but this is your you're actually able to verify that these people are very much qualified in the certain field and and that's not necessarily something that happens in in a marketing role for example you know yes in medicine or uh, you know, something that requires you to prove your certification. Everyone I mean, else is just winging this, it. Isn't this, the, <laughs> isn't this the quest of every dating app you've ever seen? Is yes. that you actually, I mean, as a horrible as it is to talk about that as an analogy, like it's the same yeah. evolution. Are you yeah. really who you say you are and what do you represent and so forth? And I, it is, is the it essence true? of the match. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Is it true? Um, and actually, I, I have heard you're seeing that more and more in these applications that people are paying to to get a verification to say, by the way, I've had like background checks or however it works. I'm not too sure. But to actually be like, I'm who I say I am. So 
identity verification for the win. <laughs> That's right. It's exactly the same case. Yeah, I think um, it would be it would be really interesting to think about the possibilities. And I guess we were kind of just chatting about that there. You know, the ed tech space. What could the future hold beyond what we're seeing now in terms of leveraging this verified credential through a skill set or beyond mm -hmm. if it's widely adopted? I mean, how could that change the education sector to how it to how it is today? It's just a, a really easy question for you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there's a bit. I mean, true. Uh, there are a couple of things that come to mind. One, I think we've touched on a bit, and that's first really challenging this this model of delayed gratification that your education only has value when you complete it versus being able to identify the skills and abilities that you acquire along the way that are immediately um, usable by the learner towards whatever path they are on, whether that's to additional education or whether that's to employment. Um, I also think that it's going to create a much more robust marketplace in that currently in order to pursue additional education or to pursue employment, it's all it's almost entirely the responsibility of the learner to go and find these opportunities, to go and make applications and be able to make it. And there are certain conditions that allow certain learners to more easily pursue those routes, whether it's time, resources, social capital, professional networks, that sort of thing. But when we get to where we can create a marketplace that includes employment and includes individuals with verifiable skills. And as we've learned with social media, currently the ability for me to determine what I share, who I choose to share it with, when and how, this can become a bi-directional equation whereby employers or institutions of education can find individuals with the skills, talents, or abilities that they're looking for and say, hey, you may not have heard of this, you may not have thought about us, you may not have explored this, but we think you would be a great candidate to discuss with us this opportunity. And, you know, this has worked in athletics for decades, right? Coaches go to summer basketball camps of 12-year-olds to find some kid who's a good shooter and start talking to mom. Why can't we do that for everything else and allow that marketplace to exist for there to be a more fluid matching of talent, skills, and abilities, and it not just be about the learner chasing down an opportunity, but really allowing it to work both directions. And to your point earlier, making sure that maybe, look, there's a lot of populations we have overlooked and marginalized for a whole host of region, uh, reasons globally. But if we reframe a lot of that around skills, competencies, and so forth, I even think that even from those that are purely profit motived or uh, driven, if you start being able to figure out like, hey, there's a whole untapped potential in this sect, you're going to do everything you can to go after it. And that mm -hmm. is a chance for us to really create much more, um, much more occupations with much more livable wages for many more people. And ultimately, that's going to uh, position society, I think, into more comfortable positions to be able to figure out a lot of the, the tougher problems that we're dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today about the great work you're doing and the Territorium is doing across the learner experience and, and explaining kind of the transformation we're seeing in this space. It's truly fascinating. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Keith, please do reach out via LinkedIn or visit their website at territorium.com for more information. We hope you enjoyed listening in today and stay tuned for more exciting discussions as we verify this.